This video is brought to you by Audolin. Are you looking for a Bluetooth vlogging remote that is solid, lightweight, and budget friendly? Check out the Audolin Bluetooth remote. It can pan a full 360 degrees tilt for vertical shooting and has a range of around 10 meters or 33 feet. I use it on the A7 IV and love it for its convenience. It's easy to pair, remotely focus, zoom, and take long or bulb exposures. It has a custom C1 button, and it's even detachable, unlike OEM. Get yours today, link is in the description. Audolin. This is the Sony 16 to 35 millimeter F4G power zoom lens for full frame E mount. This is an ultra wide lens that is sharp, small, and fully computerized like Mark Zuckerberg. Wow. There are five plus ultra wide zooms in the Sony ecosystem, and this one is quite different, so watch till the end for the full details. In this video, I'll be going over sharpness, bokeh, and how it behaves as a power zoom, and more chapters in the description. Let's get started with build and handling. If you're unfamiliar with G lenses, these are Sony's mid-tier offering, and it is a step down from G Master using less steel and more plastic like a 40-year-old Hollywood actress. <clears throat> it's weather sealed, complete with mount gasket, and you can confidently use this in inclement weather or dusty scenarios. The lens is solid in construction. However, while the hood is quality, it clearly is a notch down from GM hoods. It does not have a lock or felt lining. That said, mine has held up just fine. No inadvertent disconnects simply solid. Overall, the build is great and interestingly enough, it's more feature packed than the older GM with the inclusion of an aperture wheel complete with iris lock and the ability to move in one third increments or go fully unclicked, which can be nice for video users. The lens has a button which can be programmed in body an AF MF switch and multiple ways to toggle the zoom more on that later. The manual focus ring is typical Sony. Some resistance, however, you won't have that vintage feel of manual focus lenses. Other than that, it does seem to manual focus like other linear drive lenses. All right, time to go over sharpness. Here is the full image and we're gonna look at the center, mid frame, edge, and uh, far corners. So let's get started. Here is the center. We are at 100%. It is very sharp. Look at towards the mid frame. Again, there's no degradation. However, once you get to the edge, let's say, wow, it's so far out. There is a little bit of degradation. Moving to the far corners. This is like as far as away as you can get on the image frame. And you know, it's, it's usable, it's, it's not bad at all. You can see the, the leaf details, but it gets stronger. Here it is at F5.6 and it's probably the max. Let's see at F8, F5.6. So they are roughly unchanged at those apertures. Use it for uh, more depth of field, that sort of thing. The edge is very good. At this point, there was a slight degradation, as you can see before. There's a little bit of improvement afterwards. You know, the degradation is more uh, with the vignette than it is with the, the sharpness. Here's the mid frame. Once again, it is very good. Here's F8. Uh, yeah, it's really hard to tell between the two. Okay, moving to 24. Again, it is very good. Look at this small, tiny little sign. Oh, by the way, there's a full image. Yeah, that tiny little sign, boat rides, not an issue. Uh, the mid frame, it's crisp. I mean, and I mean, it's wide open too. We go to the edges. Yeah, 24, I'd say it performs about the same or a little bit better maybe. Then 16, uh, if you look at the far corners, there is some degradation, but it is 
fairly minor. It's it's so minor. There's no concern at all. At 5.6, it is really sharp. You see the difference? Yeah, these things just perk right up. At F8, academic reasons, you don't get much of an improvement. And here is the edge again at four and eight. There is not a lot of improvement. If you look at the fine detail right here, these leaves, yeah, they pop up once you're at 5.6 or eight. And uh, back to the center, we'll go to 35. Interestingly enough, at 35, it looks very good. Mid frame. Yeah, there's some degradation towards the outer edges. But yeah, we're all the way to the outer edges. I'd say this lens is fairly uniform. Just like the vignette is uh, more controlled at 35. It is quite clean. Uh, the leaf detail here is, is pretty good. Move to uh, f5.6. There's uh, not much change. Yeah, at f8, it does look uh, a little bit more poppy. So if you just want to stay safe, just stay at f8. Uh, 35 is probably the best focal length. It, it is really good at 35. Everywhere in the frame, even uh, wide open. Overall, this lens offers fantastic sharpness. Vlogging. Let's have a look at how it performs in that scenario. Here is a sample using standard IBIS on the a7 IV. I think it's a bit shaky, but a little bit of post stabilization will do the trick. Here's a sample of using active stabilization where there's a small crop. For the most part, I am using active stabilization most of the time. It's not perfect, but it's fine. Walk slower if you want less bumps. I don't know why anyone would walk and talk anyhow. I can hardly walk and chew gum at the same time. I find the stabilization works especially well when I'm using a two-handed rig. Any shake that occurs looks like natural camera shake, and I'm happy with the handling and the results for those situations. All right, now we're going to bokeh. And this is an ultra wide lens. Unfortunately, it cannot blur a lot because, well, it's a wide focal length and you need a large number of focal length to increase blurring. You need a small number aperture to increase blurring. This has neither, it's F4. That said, it does produce background blur. It is full frame after all. Here is 16 millimeters, so I'm focused on this leaf and you can see the background is pleasantly blurred. This might not be enough for you. However, it's there. If you're trying to get landscapes at F4 with a close background, you might get blurry pictures because you may think that the aperture is too narrow. So you do have to stop it down. The quality of the bokeh itself is, is good. It's very good. I'm not seeing any outlines. This is a harsh background, so you should expect to see, you know, misbehavior. And I'm already zoomed in 100%. Okay, so let's look at 35 millimeters now. So this is like the most amount of blur I can do. And again, I'm focused on the leaf. And you can see it right off the bat, even without zooming in, the background is blurry. Uh, the quality of the background, it can have some highlight fringing. But for the most part, it's it's good. It's very good. It has some Nissen going, but the, the blur is so small that you might not notice this on first take. You know, this type of quality bokeh issue right here, it's more noticeable if you have a lot of blurring going on. But since there isn't a lot of blurring, well, it's not that much of a problem. And in the background, it has some concentric rings. Other than that, once you're in a little bit, the circular blobs are quite nice. With normal use, the blurring ability is just fine in my opinion. It's pleasant. There's not much 
going for it. Most of the time you'll be in focus. This type of lens is meant to catch a lot of things in focus. We're going to look at Loka, AKA Boca CA. Here we are at 16 millimeter F4. As you stop down, it's going to clean up. However, wide open, I'm having trouble finding anything. This is a hundred percent. So what we're looking for is like this green and purple outlining in the bokeh. Uh, this is a white background right here. And uh, I'm looking for a green outline here. And uh, we're at a hundred percent already. It's not really an issue. Oh, here's some right here towards the far corners. And this could be, well, this is in the focal plane. So this is probably uh, CA, which we'll get to next. Let's look at 35 millimeter. Here we are, 100%, 35 millimeters. And as you can see, there should be a gradual amount of greening, but there isn't. Having a look at CA. I'm not sure why I'm at 17 millimeters, but this is close enough. So CA definitely appears in the corners wide open. It's it's a small amount um, anywhere else in the frame. It's there. It's not too powerful. And this is wide open. Stop down to 5.6 and you see it cleans up quite well. It's mostly gone at this point. It still lingers around at the very far corners at 35 millimeters. I believe this is a much cleaner focal length overall is sharper and uh, you know, there is no CA. Let's have a look at flare and sun stars. Have a look. As you can see, it's extremely flare resistant and that's great because the hood won't protect much. If you're getting flare, look at your filters because that's probably the one causing it. Contrast is well maintained and it's consistent through the range. This is something you get out of a GM Prime. It's fantastic. So good that it might be considered too digital. Sun stars are a bit limited with the zoom. You have to stop down to F16 to get some definition. Let's take a look at focus breathing starting at 16 millimeter. A lens with heavy focus breathing may feel like you're zoomed in at one end of the focus spectrum compared to the other. This lens performs well in this regard. There's no distraction. There's no zoom in effect. You won't need any lens compensation tricks and it'll work great on any camera. Here's a look at 35 millimeter. Once again, it is fantastic. This lens behaves very well. This lens is about as neutral as it gets when it comes to focus breathing performance. All right, let's have a look at the parfocal performance. This lens is digitally parfocal. I believe it's called smooth motion optics. It'll correct itself. However, a minor thing is that if you zoom very fast, you can see it going out of focus. And since we're on that topic, let's talk about the power zoom. Since the lens has no markings, it can be disorienting when you first turn on the camera. You might be zoomed in, you might be at the widest. And with my memory of a goldfish, I can't recall the last safe setting. I got used to it after a while, not a major issue. If framing isn't good, when I turn on the camera, then I change it. And then on the camera, the indicator helps me. It has its advantages in that you can see what focal length you are at without looking at the lens itself. So you could have your eye in the viewfinder and still see it. The physical on lens zoom controls are either toggle or zoom ring. Take a note that the zoom ring is extremely sensitive, very easy to activate, not necessarily change focal length. I don't think you can control the speed other than the pressure you put on the toggle or the speed in which you turn the zoom. When it comes to other controls like the remote or app, you can adjust those speeds. One is very slow, the default. Three is also slow. I like to use the fastest setting personally. However, that's something you'll have to experiment with. And the power zoom has some quirks. 
First off, when you turn on the camera and start using it right away, you'll get an error message. It takes about half a second before the camera is ready and the message is annoying. Second, clear image zoom is automatically triggered when using this for video. What I find is that using fast zoom speed and clear image zoom is not a great combination. Once clear image zoom activates, you lose focus map, although peaking works just fine. So what's up with that, Sony? You also lose control of advanced focus. It's simply center zone at this point. And eye face tracking during video is shut off. So there are a lot of factors that make it too complicated and I shut it off by default. Digital zoom is something nobody talks about and I wanna talk about it. The a7 IV down samples from the 7K. So in theory, it has some room to digital zoom similar to clear image zoom. However, clear image zoom gives you 1.5 magnification while digital zoom gives you a whopping 4x magnification. I'll figure this out in a future video, a long-term review of this camera. In theory, you have an ultra wide that can go all the way to short telephoto. That is an incredible range. Let's talk about the size. This thing is small. However, it wasn't the first to go that route in the ultra wide category. Here's a look next to the Tamron 17 to 28 F 2.8, a stop faster with less range. The Sony comes in at 353 grams. The Tamron comes in at 420 grams, 77 gram difference. Because the Tamron is longer, you will notice the difference in weight. The Sony takes 72 millimeter filters, which can be annoying if you have a lot of 67 millimeters like the 24GM or the 20G or many other Tamrons. The lens is legit small, even smaller than the 24G Master, so it is convenient to have around. Let's talk about value. This lens comes in about 1200 US dollars, and I think that's about right for this lens, a thousand less than the 2.8G Master. Tamron Sigma have late model offerings that are f2.8 and cost less, and they have less range and less controls. So I think the price is fair. At the end of the day, $1,200 is spending, not gonna lie. And it hurts, especially when I'm not chilling for free products. Wow. Final thoughts. It does look like I found my de facto ultra wide lens. It excels in video and stills. And I would say that the sharpness is about the level of the 24 to 105. And similarly, everything is very nice all the time, all apertures. The optics are very strong. What's different is that this lens is truly small for a zoom and a delight to carry around. You can feel it after hours of use and while it's not compact G level, this is a zoom and it's quite small. Consider your old DSLR ultra wide. It was probably 600 grams for the equivalent and much bigger. We've gone a long way since then. If you absolutely must live with an F2.8, then that's that. This lens isn't for you. However, I'm more open-minded when it comes to slow lenses. I use micro four thirds. Well, not much after owning this lens. So it comes down to perspective. For those that use gimbals or stabilizers, you appreciate that this lens does internal zooming. So the need to balance is kept at a minimum. For still shooters, I think the power zoom is plenty fast, responsive, precise, and quirky. However, it's not slow, and I can't imagine it being problematic for any type of user. Overall, I find this lens to be phenomenal, and it could be that honeymoon feeling, or maybe it's really that good. Anyhow, thank you so much for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video and see you on the next one. Take care.